Catholic bishops concerned with lack of consultation. Pangu Party welcomes Marape Group. And new library for Central's Pari Village. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Friday's news. The Catholic Bishops Conference of PNG and Solomon Islands is concerned with the lack of consultative process by the government. Archbishop Rokus Tatamai says for eight years, the shift in education policies has hindered the delivery of education services provided by the Catholic Church. He says the government, through the Education and Higher Education Department, failed to consult the church as a development partner. Speaking this morning at the CBC headquarters, Father Rokus Tatamai expressed the need for consultation between state agencies and church leaders in the education sector. He says for Structure 166, cost-benefit analysis was never done. Bishop Rokus says for unknown reasons, the state failed to talk to the church. A lot of times things happen without consultation. That's why we are raising this issue and only now uh, there is some dialogue happening. But many times when you have delivered uh, statements and policies without the input of your partner. The matter concerns the transfer of Catholic-run teachers' college to the higher education department. Similar concerns were raised for the online selection where Catholic agencies were left out. The church also noticed that grants budgeted by the state for church-run organizations has been paid less than one-third of the allocated proportion. If these demands are not met for 2020 school year, we will take appropriate legal action to protect the rights of our teachers, students and parents to the quality education that is being destroyed by so, so many decisions of the current government and the, Department of, uh, the National Department of Education. The Catholic Bishop Conference of PNG and Solomon Islands says many issues affecting health and education, even law and order, is far from being addressed. While the church dislikes delving to politics, the CBC says a rate of corruption in all levels of government, including the private sector, is of major concern. Again, the promise of establishing the ICAC bill was questioned by the church. Uh, the one thing that could be done fairly soon would be the implementation of the Independent Commission Against Corruption, which our leaders have agreed to uh, set up, but it is still not happened. And of course, that ICAC has to have some kind of teeth. Jekyll Parva, Jr., National MTV News. Taripuri MP James Marape and other MPs who defected from the People's National Congress have accepted an invitation to join Pangu Party. This now brings their total number of the party to 21, making it one of the biggest parties in the Laguna camp. Earlier in the week, the party had no parliamentary wing after all MPs resigned. One week ago, Pangu was effectively without a parliamentary wing after 15 MPs resigned. The only member who remained was Morabe Governor Ginson Saonu, and he was appointed, not elected, using the party constitution by the party council. It was the only way the party could remain relevant in any vote of no confidence motion. <laughs> Today, Ginson Saonu invited James Marape and other former PNC MPs to join the Pangu party. They accepted. I officially, on behalf of the party, Pangu Party Caucus, uh, Pangu Executive and Pangu supporters nationwide, I formally invite the Honorable James Marape and his PNC team who moved from PNC party to this side of the house. In 21 days, Pangu has morphed from an embattled, revived pre-independence political force to zero membership, and today to 21 members with the inclusion of James Barapa's group of MPs. Behind the scenes, MPs associated with Pangu have been trying to keep the party alive. 
The primary reason has been the historical legacy of the party, its association with the founding father of Papua New Guinea, Sir Michael Somare, and because it represented a collection of leaders from all over the country during independence. It has a national brand to it, and I am uh, on behalf of the team that I lead out of PNC. Uh, we are humbled by the kind offer of invitation by the leader of the party at the moment, and we have met, we have discussed, there have been many offers on the table for us. We also have been looking at the opportunity to uh, rebrand ourselves and, and put ourselves into one uh, uh, structure uh, in as far as political parties are concerned. But uh, the offer from Pangu was very appetizing. Going forward, James Marape says Pangu is better poised to take on future challenges as they prepare for a vote. Scott Wade, National MTV News. While Parliament will resume in the next three weeks, members of the opposition will be taking to public forums organized by Enga and Morbe province. Both public forums will take place in the provincial capitals of Wabeg and Leh. The member for Medeng, Brian Kremer, has invited anyone concerned about the country to attend the forum as he will be attending with other opposition members. Um, at the inv in Enga province, at the invitation of the, the governor, Sir Peter Ipatas, as well as the member for Wabag, uh, Dr. Lino Tom. So that is on the 17th, uh, Friday the 17th, which is next Friday. So myself, Gary Jufa, Alan Bird um, will be accompanying the, the governor and Dr. Lino. And then uh, to opportunity to speak at this forum, uh, organized or public awareness conduct organized by the governor, where he wants to explain to the people of Enga his decision, recent decision, uh, following while he was in camp, the Lugwini camp, to leave the O'Neill government uh, to lay on the 21st at Eriku Oval. So, the, and again, yeah, that's at the invitation of the governor of, uh, of Morabe, and as well as the member for Lay Open, John Russell. So we're now calling all Morabians throughout PNG and abroad and in, from Morabe and as well as residents of Leh um, to turn up to that event. I've asked for the governor to see if he can declare a public holiday for that day so everyone can come and actually spend the time, bring their families and hear the issues because politics decides everything. Price of bread, medicine, hospital, roads are fixed, schools, everything. And it's about their kids at the end of the day. That's what we're fighting for. The National Court has ordered a halt to the Wafi Gopu project until all matters relating to the signing of the project memorandum of understanding are heard. The decision also bars agents of government like the Mineral Resources Authority or MRA from conducting any forums between landowners and other project stakeholders. The application for leave for judicial review was sought by lawyers representing the Morbe provincial government. The provincial government went to court after the project MOU was signed in Port Moresby despite their opposition. Everything to be clear. As governor of the Moroby province, Genson Saonu expressed that the provincial government wanted a 15% stake in the mine and wanted to raise financing for it. But the process that led to the signing of the MOU was done hurriedly, giving no time for consultation. The national government, through the mining minister Johnson Tuke, is said to have sped up the process with state solicitor Daniel Roll Pagarea, providing a clearance letter that is now being questioned by the provincial government. I have this mandate to participate and not to be a spectator or left alone and just to uh, hear and watch other people uh, sign or make decision in the process of getting the mining off the ground. The national government was looking to sign the MOU with project developers Newcrest during the annual mining conference in Sydney in December 2018. According to court documents, the Prime Minister summoned the Morbe Governor Ginzan Saonu and the Mining Minister Johnson Tuke in Sydney and requested that both leaders sign in front of project developers. Governor Saonu refused, saying he was not aware of the terms of the MOU. The disagreements and the lack of consultation triggered the temporary closure of the Wafi Golpu project by locals. 
The National Court determined that the concerns raised by the provincial government were genuine and the provincial government had sufficient interest in standing to represent the concerns of people in court. I'm happy to announce that we successfully got through that uh, court proceedings and we won the case and this case means that the, the next process must be taken so that uh, whatever the court decision, uh, I think everybody will fall in line so that when the mining get off the ground, it's in the best interest of everybody and not people in the authority or one person. As much as possible, the Morobe provincial government wants the most participation from local clans and other districts in Morobe. Governor Saonu has argued that the MOU in its present form excludes people from participating in a big way. Scott Waide, National MTV News. You're tuned in to National MTV News. Still ahead, slow delivery of medicines in Morbe and accommodation problems affecting police personnel in East New Britain. Stay tuned for those stories and more after the break. Welcome back. A Baptist-run health centre in the Obura Wanenara district of Eastern Highlands province waits for almost six months before they receive their medical supplies. The Owena Health Centre of the Lamari local level government is the only health centre that serves almost 8,000 people. The only three serving nurses who work there told MTV News that the slow delivery of medical supplies has caused suffering and even death among young children, pregnant mothers and the elderly. This health centre is located in a remote area of Lamari local level government in Obura Waninara district, Eastern Islands province. It's the only health centre in Owena village that serves almost 8,000 people. There are also four aid posts operating there with limited medical supplies. The only three officers working at the health centre said they wait for almost six months before they receive their medical supplies. The government spends over 80 million kina each year to contractors responsible for the supply and distribution of medical drugs to hospitals, health centers and aid posts throughout the country. The Borneo Pacific Pharmaceuticals Limited is the company contracted by the government to supply medical drugs for health centers like Owena. LD Logistics is the company contracted by the National Department of Health to be the national distributor of medicines and medical supplies to hospitals, clinics and rural aid posts. The health officers of Owena Health Center say the delivery of their medical supply is very poor. Give him call out law office or Lara plan line law. Give him help him so also look look law this latter so now league league see call this law and had marasin and penis so me plus a stop chon and look look now. According to the health officers, infant and maternal issues have been a concern for almost nine years. There are no basic drugs such as painkillers and antibiotics. The health center doesn't have a sterilizer to clean the medical equipment. During a medevac to Owena village in Obura Waninara district on Tuesday by Manolos Aviation, the lay based helicopter company donated two boxes of basic drugs that were bought in Germany to assist the health center. Julie Badui Oa, National MTV News, Lay. Labu Butu aid post in Huon Gulf District has been closed since 2016. The aid post serves a population of over 3,500 people. Since its closure, people have been traveling to Lay to seek treatment. Labu Butu in the Wampa local level government is a 15-minute dinghy ride from Lay. 
Sick patients spend about 10 kina plus additional medical fees on a daily basis to travel to lay and back. Ward councillor Sam Yabong says the closure of the aid post is due to issues with housing for medical officers. Uh, ADB am assisting me for maintenance. I was going to operate. Doctor, I'm working on a hybrid doctor and back up. So time doctor, I'm a mass place man. So time I'm going back now, like him outside man, now like him from a mass building doctor's house. So now we have to build him doctor's house here to complete the doctor back up to the East New Britain police are facing a shortage of police manpower prompted by accommodation scarcity. During a police parade today, Provincial Police Commander Senior Inspector Joseph Tabali admitted to his men and women that accommodation remained one issue that they have been trying to fix for many years. Tabali says Kokopo Town is fast developing, but not the personnel under his command. Like anywhere else in the country, police personnel in East New Britain province have their own stories to tell. Most of these stories are about accommodation problems that have plagued them for a very long time. This is one of very few times that the head of the police in the province, Senior Inspector Joseph Tabali, finds time to talk to his men and women collectively. And amongst many issues facing the police in the province, the Bali told his staff that accommodation and mobility problems to respond to crimes are issues that have remained unchanged in recent years. I need more manpower. Uh, but the thing is, accommodation, it's a problem again. And I have approached the provincial administrator, administration, and even uh, uh, the police minister. Uh, uh, Honorable uh, Delta Wong, um, he assured me that he's going to uh, provide accommodation for policemen up at uh, the Central District. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. For the PPC, it is hard work managing a team of police officers who rent their own homes and come to work every day. Officers' absenteeism is common, and when coupled with other issues like shortage of staff, it is already a burden for the provincial police command. We've got 200 plus manpower currently on the ground, and you're looking at the population of East Newport province, uh, New province alone, it's about uh, 200,000 plus, nearly 300,000, which uh, we need more policemen uh, here in the province. The ratio is 1 to 1,000 plus, the too many, a police officer, one police officer cannot deal with 1,000 plus. Since 2012, numerous proposals have been made to build more houses for staff and improve mobility and communication for the police in the province. All these were based on a proposed police modernization program that will cost the state about 270 million kina to address all the issues facing the PNG Royal Constabulary, but that is yet to eventuate. In recent years, Kokopo is slowly developing from a town into a city. Businesses have expanded and more are poised to happen. A large influx of people are coming in to live and work here. But what is more worrying is the policing of the town. And with the current issues on hand, effective policing of the city will remain a lingering problem. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. Pari Elementary School in the Motu Koitabu area in the nation's capital will now have a new library for its children. The library is an initiative of the Motu Koita Assembly in partnership with the Book Belong Pikinini Library. At the groundbreaking ceremony today, Motu Koita Assembly Chairman Dadi Toko Jr. said the library will play a big part in the children's education. Pari Elementary School is in the Motukoita area of the nation's capital. The groundbreaking ceremony today saw children and parents attending to witness this exciting development in their school. The construction of the library is funded by the Motukoita Assembly under the National Capital District Infrastructure Budget and will be managed and run by Book Belong Pikinini Library. You know, we believe that uh, um, uh, you know having a library is is imperative to any school. Um, so it's very important to, to have a, a, a school open, uh, sorry, a library open up here. So we've gone into partnership with Book, Book Belong Pikinini, um, um, and uh, 
we will be constructing the the, 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 the library and Book Belong Pekinini will be uh, running the library. Education and health is a priority area the Motukoita Assembly is focused on since being in office seven months ago. And the library in Pari Elementary School will be an opportunity for children to read books at an early age. Motukoita Assembly Chairman Dari Toka Jr. when speaking at the groundbreaking ceremony encouraged the children to read more books as it is good for their future. Um, so it's a very good partnership, well, one that's worked um, uh, throughout the country, and, and, and I'm very happy to announce that we, um, you know, this partnership will now be seen not just at Pari, but through Hagara and to other Motukoita schools um, in the nation's capital. The chairman said there are plans to partner with the Book Belong Pikinini Library to build more libraries in other elementary schools in Motukoita. The Motukoita Assembly has also made funds available for renovations and rebuilding classrooms and other school infrastructure projects in all Motukoita schools. There's a lot of issues with infrastructure, uh, as you'll see in all our villages, um, and and this is part of the, the, the you know the, the rollout that we're doing, uh, where we're trying to focus um, a, a lot of our funds into into uh, renovating, rebuilding classrooms, um, you know wherever necessary, so the children here um, have a very good space uh, um, and, um, to to to, uh, uh, to to attend school in. Rayon Lakingu National MTV News. This is Friday's news. We take a look at stories making headlines overseas after these messages. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas now, just days after becoming a dad, the Duke of Sussex travelled to the Netherlands on Thursday to launch the countdown for the next Invictus Games. As CNN reports, it's a project close to his heart. No rest for this royal. Prince Harry was back to work Thursday with a quick trip to The Hague. Tearing himself away from Master Archie after just three and a bit days cannot have been easy. But in many ways, this is one of Prince Harry's professional babies. He created the Invictus Games in 2014 for a cause that he is really passionate about, the welfare of servicemen and women. The Prince spent a decade in the army as Captain Wales, taking in two tours of Afghanistan. When he left, he saw a way he could continue to make a difference. I'd seen firsthand the transformative power of sport in helping people physically and psychologically recover and knew that the Invictus Games would change lives, capture hearts and inspire a generation, the Invictus generation. And the Prince himself inspires many in his visits. Yeah, Prince Harry yeah, took a lot of time for us actually. Uh, he was very interested in, uh, in my story and also uh, what my goals are for next year and the sports that I'm competing in. There have been four Invictus Games so far. London, Orlando, Toronto and Sydney. Athletes representing the Netherlands have competed in each one. The fifth Invictus Games will take place here in Zouder Park in The Hague exactly one year from now. And in true Dutch style, His Royal Highness took to a bike to see how the preparations were going. We chose you for a reason, and it wasn't just because I liked the colour orange. Thank you all for guarding the Invictus spirit, and see you in 2020. Princess Marguerite of the Netherlands joined the launch event, proud to be a part of it. It's very important for the people involved, and I think for better respect. And understanding. And while Master Archie may have been hundreds of miles away, he wasn't far from everyone's thoughts. <laughs> Receiving a special Invictus onesie, although he may need a bigger one soon. Your yes. Highness will Master Archie be coming next year. Yes. Terry, can I please have a selfie? <laughs> They'll have to check on Archie's diary. There's no doubt though, a visit from the royal family's littlest would make for an extra special Invictus Games in 2020. An award-winning presenter on BBC Radio has been fired after tweeting about the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's baby. The post, which included a picture of the couple holding hands with a chimpanzee, has sparked accusations of racism. As the press arrived at Danny Baker's house this morning, he opened the door to reveal he'd just been sacked. The conversation had not been cordial. 
So, in by mutual agreement, we terminate. <laughs> The reason? This tweet. A vintage photograph of a couple, and we're not showing the full image, but between them was a chimpanzee dressed in a coat and a bowler hat, and a reference to the royal baby. Remember, we take all those arguments on board. Of Fanny Baker says it was a mistake, he deleted the tweet, and it was not a comment on the Duchess of Sussex's African-American heritage, but many feel it was unforgivable. Among them, a fellow presenter on a Five Live podcast. When I saw it, I was shocked, genuinely shocked, disgusted. Not someone thought that was acceptable was beyond me. The BBC said this was a serious error of judgment, it goes against their values, and Danny Baker will no longer be presenting his weekly show. However, the presenter says this was a grotesque error, and he claims he had no idea which raw baby it was and who the parents were. I asked him again, did he really not know whose baby it was? Oh, I genuinely don't know the royal baby, Archie. I've put one joke up about underneath the Archies. Otherwise, the that's the thing. I know you've got incredulous looking at You simply wouldn't do that, would you? If someone of colour had a baby. You wouldn't do that. You know, You're the only person in the country who didn't know that she'd had a baby. Plainly, the proof is in the pudding. I would not. And remember, he is an award-winning broadcaster on a national radio programme. His career at the BBC is over. Residents of an upmarket community in Los Angeles have been shocked to learn of their neighbour's massive secret hall of weapons. More than a thousand guns have been discovered inside a mansion. Tonight, the man accused of stockpiling more than 1,000 weapons at a mansion in one of America's wealthiest neighborhoods is out of jail. I've never seen so many weapons in my career of 31 years. The LAPD and ATF now investigating whether 57-year-old Gerard Damien Sainz was allegedly selling numerous assault weapons, rifles, and ammunition from this lavish Holmby Hills neighborhood, and why. Beyond uh, comprehension that somebody can have so many weapons in a residence like this, in a, in a a neighborhood such like this. Police serving a warrant after receiving a tip. The gang narcotics division and the ATF received a complaint that the individual at this residence was selling illegal weapons. Authorities claim the suspect was manufacturing firearms illegally inside the home that is owned by a woman once romantically linked to an heir of the Getty fortune. Neighbors tonight in shock. We were surprised and I have kids and I have two kids and it's kind of scary. Now, it started out as a swim in a local river, but turned into a fascinating discovery when an Otago man stumbled across the only moa footprints found in the South Island of New Zealand. The fossil, believed to be over a million years old, were uncovered in the Kaiben River. There goes the moa, and here's the mark it left behind. It's just astonishing to think of a moa just walking through some muddy sediments, you know, going about its business, slightly turning right, you know, and I think other people should see that because the moa holds a special place in New Zealand, New Zealanders' hearts. A local tractor driver just stumbled on the marks while out for a swim. It's another hot day, so we brought the dogs down and they were playing around, so walked into the water and, yeah, well, found this random shelf with these footprints on it and sent it to the Otago Museum. Came out a week later to, to the site here, put on my snorkeling mask and my wetsuit and dove on into the swimming hole and then, uh, yeah, had a look at the prints under the water and they were just mind-blowing, way better than the photos indicated. Two months later, works began to remove the find, diverting the river to empty out the swimming hole. They weren't going to last here. If we see a fossil on the surface like these, it's almost gone. So I think the outcome here, great, great potential outcome. Prints are roughly 30 centimetres in length and 30 centimetres wide. All up, there are seven of them, estimated to be more than a million years old. Experts believe the prints may have come from a bush or upland mower. The angle of the prints, the distance between them, the depth of them, we'll be able to calculate the weight, the stride length. This will help us get a better picture of what that bird was like when it walked across that silt all those years ago. Using a masonry saw to preserve the tread in 3D, one print was removed this afternoon. It'll be treated to make sure it doesn't crack and end up in the Otago Museum. Not really much of a museum gower, if it's to be perfectly honest, but Oh, if it's got my name on it, I'd better go have a look. With the footprint and the mower's call that to Papa's been able to recreate, this long-lost bird is just a little bit closer. 
Stay tuned, we'll take a look at some sporting action in Chuka Sports coming up next. Chukai Sports Welcome to Chukai Sports. Vitis Industries today cleared the air around the sponsorship of the Fortuna Fresh Central Dabaris team following what they have described as misleading and incorrect. Sponsor and Vice Chair Lady Vicky Mossin today said yesterday's press conference called by other board members was uncalled for and that such matters were only meant to be discussed as an internal matter by the Dabaris board and management. Mossin confirmed in today's press conference that Vitis Industries still remains a sponsor of the Central Dabaris. Vitis Industries today confirmed that it is still a sponsor of the Central Dabaris. Platinum sponsor Vicky Mossin says the announcements in yesterday's press conference were shocking and disappointing to Vitis Industries as a sponsor for all the hard work and huge money committed to unite Central Province people throughout the country in the form of one team. I want to see transparency, accountability by the management of the Central Dabaris accounts for team officials and players to be truly benefit air and their welfare taken care of. She says as a major sponsor, Central Dabari's board was simply asked to provide reports of financial transactions and players' welfare information. She added the Central Dabari's management also promised to promote Vitis Industries and its brands, however, it hasn't been happening. All of which some of the board members insinuated the withdrawal of sponsorship by Vitis Industries. I want to inform the Central Dabari's fans throughout PNG that I am still the platinum sponsor for the Central Dabari and I am here to stay. Board member Guaibo Mairi says a meeting will be called for board members to come together and solve internal issues. The message that the sponsor got to the management was uh, for them to finish a financial statement in order for her to continue putting money into the Dabari account. She didn't have that response. That's why she said, I am going to deal with the player welfare, player payment, and all other financial matters that were going to be handled by her and herself. He urged all board members to prioritize their objectives and start making decisions as a team and not as an individual. Captain Adam Koraves says such matters are not for the team to solve, but rather let the board deal with the issues. I think uh, that's going to uh, stop us you know, play the game on the weekend. So for that issue, we're just going to focus on the game and then we'll leave it to the board and the sponsor to go ahead with everything that's going on. Kurave says it is still training as usual for the players as they look forward to playing their third home game in round six of the Intercity Rugby League competition this weekend. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. The PNG Rugby Football League on Tuesday announced the appointment of Nigel Hukula as the head coach for the PNG Orchids. Chairman of the PNG RFL, Sunday Saka, said the PNG RFL board, which appoints the head coach of the Kumuls, Hunters, Orchids and all its international teams during its meeting on Tuesday, endorsed Hukula's appointment. The PNG Orchids have a busy calendar this year, participating in four international events, including the Pacific Games in Samoa in July. After resigning from his assistant coach role in the SPPNG Hunters, Nigel Hukula has been called back into the Papua New Guinea Rugby Football League, this time as coach of the national women's team, the Oil Search PNG Orchids. The Orchids was formed in 2017 so that PNG would have a national women's team playing in the Rugby League World Cup. Since 2017, there have been three coaches, the first being Dennis Mial, the second was David Wesley and now Hukula has been given the job. His first order of business is preparing the team for their first match this year on June 22nd, where PNG will play the Fiji women's team. 
Hukula, speaking during the FM 100 Talkback show, stressed that development was key to achieving consistent performance at the international level. Consistency on the uh, international stage is a, um, something that we're looking to maintain, but uh, in saying that also, uh, development is a, is a great part of what uh, I would be looking at um, to, to have a basis for all those young girls coming through who want to play this code. With only two years of active international competition, the Orchids still lack the depth. With no wins from their World Cup campaign, their last outing was in 2018, when they lost 48-14 to the Brisbane Broncos women's team. It's a four or five year process to get that athlete to that um, physical and mental state that you'd like, so that's where that development aspect comes in. But look, if there's if there's anyone in another code that um, would like to have a go, or um, uh, we think uh, would be good for our code, then we'd have a look. Hukula, who is keen on development for the growth of the women's game, will be looking to build a team over time. From the local competitions you get to your um, confederates and confederates to the national championships. So the national schools program also mirrors the same concept. And um, in, in regard to development, that's where we'd be looking at uh, helping to uh, progress and, and move forward. The girls came through the national schools program as well. And little chip, uh, grab a kick foot through, uh -oh. Hukula's chasing through, he ends up grounding the football. Hukula is Kumul number 206 and debuted against the Australian Kangaroos in Port Mosby in 2001. He was the assistant coach to the Gorokala Hanis from 2011 to 2012. Hukula was the assistant coach to the SPPNG Hunters from 2016 till March this year. Fidelis Sukina National MTV Sports. Chuka Sports continues after the break. Stay tuned. Chukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. England club football's remarkable European resurgence continues with Arsenal and Chelsea today booking their spots in the second tier Europa League final. With Tottenham and Liverpool already confirmed for the Champions League showdown, it means for the first time ever both major European Cup finals will be played by teams from one nation. If the European club competitions proven anything this season, English football is reigning supreme. Look at the space here for Loftus Cheek. will settle a few nerves. German side Frankfurt ready to make an impact though. Luka Jovic. The underdog's dream still very much alive, but with the score tied up after 120 minutes of football. Back in from Eden Hazard. But surely. It's still being no result. There's the final whistle. They couldn't be split over two legs and then over extra time. Stamford Bridge and the football world on the edge of their seats. Penalties, the only way to separate the two teams. Just when you thought you'd seen everything. Game back on. Chelsea on the brink of victory and stepping up to take the honours was none other than Eden Hazard. set up a final showdown against Arsenal which took down Spanish side Valencia 4-2. And the shot on the turn finds the bottom corner. The Gunners running away with their victory all thanks to hat-trick hero Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. And Arsenal score again and it's Aubameyang once more. And Aubameyang's going in here and he scored his hat-trick. Sensational stuff. It's the first time ever all four English teams are in the final of Europe's two major football competitions. Something to really brag about. Successfully switching codes as an elite athlete is pretty rare. Actually, it's rarer still to do it after a full professional career as a star quarterback in the NFL. But former Dallas Cowboy Tony Roma is now mixing it up on the U.S. golf tour. He's no stranger to the big occasion. Touchdown! Romo comes in and Romo scores. And now former Dallas Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo is scoring again. He's got 3-18. and 18. That is in. Touchdown. Yeah, he's had that kind of reaction before. 
playing in his third PGA Tour event, courtesy of a sponsor's exemption, but this time at his home course of Trinity Forest in Dallas, Texas, where local knowledge was on his side. And he walks in a birdie putt at number one. An eagle chip at the seventh, making a mockery of his 10,000 to one odds. Romo showing the short game of a three-time major winner, literally. That's probably one of Jordan's rusty wedges. Yeah, it is as well. The club handed down from good friend and fellow Texan Jordan Spieth, who maybe should have held on to it. And there was a time when Spieth's wedge was accompanied in the bag by a putter belonging to a certain Tiger Woods. But Romo today showcasing his latest putter along with his latest technique. That's the biggest split grip, grip I've seen for a few years. Perhaps even the widest grip since this guy. Oh, why didn't you just go home? Luckily, Romo kept his temper when his putts didn't drop. And those missed putts became more prevalent as the round went on, eventually slipping to five over par, 13 shots off the lead. But it was still his best ever round of golf at a PGA event, and certainly gave his golf and footballing fans plenty to cheer. And that story and Trikai Sports for tonight up next with the details for the next 24 hours. Trikai Sports. Trikai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight in the southern region, fine right throughout the region in Port Moresby, Daru, Kerama, Alatau and Popandita. In the Mamasa region, a shower or two in Vanimo and Wiwek, mostly fine in Medang, Wau and Lei. In the New Guinea Islands region, a shower or two right across the region in Lorengau, Kavian, Kokopo Rabao, Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, fine weather apart from morning fog right across the region in Mount Hagen, Groka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's been the new sport and weather for today, Friday, the 10th of May 2019. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, have a pleasant evening. Take care. Good night.